Thank you very much, Dr. Patel. Um, just to continue uh, the use of left ventricular assist devices, uh, we have heard that there has been a process of rapid evolution. First, as uh, a bridge uh, to transplantation, and that is how they got established. And then um, we had the use of uh, the devices um, in a semi-permanent uh, mode, if you like, uh, and that has been the bulk of the recent development, uh, the so-called destination therapy. However, arguably, the most exciting area in the field of left ventricular assist devices is the use of these devices as a bridge to recovery. And this will constitute uh, the topic of my talk. Now, heart failure, we have heard repeatedly in this meeting and before, and no doubt after, um, is a massive prob problem. Uh, but the enigma of heart failure is, apart from being global epidemic, poor prognosis, disability and death, huge financial burden, etc. The fact is, it has been defined and redefined, and but always as a syndrome. And when you use the word syndrome, it's because you don't know the cause. You don't know what's happening. And therefore, the treatment has been by necessity not specific. And this again stems from the simple fact that the basic mechanisms of heart failure remain unknown. Where do we go from here? There has been theories throughout the years. First, I would thought heart failure has to be due to some form of changes in the heart cardiac changes, whether they're toxic, ischemic, or whatever. Then came in the vascular theory. It's all in the vessels, and that's what the target for treatment. Then it was thought to be a neurohumoral. Then it was thought to be cytokine mediated, and the cytokine can come from the gut, but we learn more that they can come from the heart itself. And now, the focus of research is in the process which is called remodeling. What is remodeling? Remodeling um, has been defined and redefined, but it is the changes in the myocardium which are responsible for heart failure. And there are many causes, as I mentioned, some are triggers, and then some perpetuate the, the damage of, or the progression of remodeling. But conventional wisdom had it that remodeling is relentless, with maybe temporary remissions. And so I'm talking about the structural changes in the myocardium. However, few recent trials if, with drugs have shown that actually that process is not relentless and it can regress in the process called reverse remodeling. What is extremely exciting, and it is the topic of my talk, is that bridge to recovery using left ventricular assist devices for the first time has shown, at least in some patients, that there is near, near complete reverse remodeling 
which allows these patients, the heart comes back, both structurally and functionally, to near normal, and these patients survive without the device and with minor drug treatment. That's very exciting, both in terms of the value to the patient, but even more so in offering an unprecedented opportunity to unravel the secrets of heart failure and the basic mechanisms at cellular and molecular levels. This, uh, there has never been an opportunity in the history of heart failure which is as good, as, as exciting as this. In what way? Now we have to go to who are the major players in the process of remodeling. And I will not uh, take all the afternoon uh, outlining the major players and what they do, but just suffice to say that four of them are very clear major players. The first is the myocyte, the contractile cell. More about that. Endothelial cells and capillaries are major players. Now, in the past, we thought fibroblasts were just a nuisance and just filling uh, areas of damage as scar tissue. Not so. They are uh, major players, even in the normal heart, because they have receptors, they respond to uh, mediators in the circulation, they may respond to drugs like beta-2 agonists, and they influence the cardiomyocyte. And more recently, we have seen all these excellent trials, I think, very promising, of transdifferentiation of fibroblasts, either from the skin, but also from the heart, into contractile cardiomyocytes. And the group here at QCRC, who are present in this room, are interested in just that. Isn't it, Christoph? Uh, that's, again, showing how important the fibroblasts are. But they are a chemical factory as well. Our group and others have been showing that they secrete a lot of mediators uh, which affect cardiovascular function. The matrix, yet another very exciting player, major player, because it used to be thought, again, as an inert substance around the cells. Not so. They are major players in more than one way. We know now that the topology of cardiomyocytes is essential. For example, if you have cells, IPS or any type of cell which you differentiate towards cardiomyocytes, you need to align them or put them in a specific way to start functioning as cardiomyocytes, and that has molecular implications. Furthermore, uh, the matrix, and there is a lot of work in that area, and QCRC is interested in that, and in the chemical composition, they're very, very specific, and they influence the function of the cardiomyocytes with a cross talk. Now we know for sure that mechanoreceptors are essential for both differentiation and maintenance of the function of cardiomyocytes. And there is a lot, a massive amount of research into the importance of matrix and matrix composition in regeneration of the heart and function and reversing heart failure. Now, I talked about cardiomyocytes as being one of the major players, and that's obvious. And in heart failure, like you see in the middle panel, the cardiomyocytes enlarge and also change their shape compared to the normal from a donor heart in the upper panel. The interesting thing is that with unloading with left ventricular assist devices, they go back to normal or near normal uh, shape and size, like in the donor heart. This used to be thought of as definite recovery, 
but our group, especially Chester at Shiano at Hafield, has shown that this is not so. Yes, it is something to be welcomed. It's not atrophy, but recovery requires more than change in size and shape. So that's being watched very carefully. You can study size by a variety of means, like with confocal microscopy, now digital microscopy, uh, but also electrophysiologically. And we have Christian Bonzidoff here that talk about cell capacitance as a measure of the size of the cells. But the cardiomyocytes size also, many things happen. And one of them is receptors. And you can see here is uh, with following left ventricular assist devices, the number of beta adrenergic receptors, as well as their location on the cell, increase dramatically and the, and the, the location changes. This cartoon just is here to show you from a publication of our, from our group some time ago that inside the cardiomyocyte there are several important molecules. Needless to say that the contractile apparatus, the sarcomere, and all the proteins of the sarcomere are very, very important. But changes in the sarcomere apart uh, the non-sarcomeric cytoskeletal proteins which link the sarcomere to the cell membrane and the outside to the extracellular matrix are absolutely essential and change dramatically in heart failure. And the evidence has come again from genetic diseases and you had Despina Sanudo yesterday about how the mutations in both the sarcomeric and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but also in the non-sarcomeric cytoskeletal proteins can cause dilated cardiomyopathy. So the evidence is overwhelming. And that can change again during recovery. Another area which is so important is calcium handling, because you know that the calcium is the, the mediator and the transmitter for contraction. And these are a variety of changes which happen in calcium handling proteins during recovery. And I listed a few uh, on the slide, but one of the most important is in CERCA2, sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, and that has been used as the target for therapy. And uh, Despina and her colleagues in Spain uh, Athens are very interested in that, and that is now being used for gene therapy. Finally, I will be very quick on that, because Michael Ibrahim in uh, Hairfield has been interested in changes in um, the myocardial surface, uh, particularly in the T-tubules. And you can study that by a variety of means. And he's shown that the, both the number and the topology of the um, T-tubules, which are essential for myocardial function, can change. And it is reversible in heart failure. Now, also, we know about stem cells. And are they involved in reverse remodeling? There is some evidence that this is the case, and that overexpression, for example, of IGF-1 increases homing factors like stf one and that can cause homing of progenitor cells. And we know from the newt and the zebrafish, where the pressure is very, very low, they have a massive power of regeneration. Thus, pressure and mechanoreceptors play a part. This is very important because VAD treatment can be a platform for both cell therapy and gene therapy. This is suggested from this slide where you see before and after. And you see how the cells have changed. And you can argue 
some of the stem cell biologists say, on after recovery, these are progenital cells. I'm, I'm not sure they are. We didn't look at them uh, by looking for stemness genes, for example. Now, I've just showed you that uh, all these, this work can act um, in different ways. And one way of studying them is to look at target genes, but also specific pathways, or go for a fishing expedition and look for everything and see what has changed. And you can look at proteomes as well, proteins, and look at biomarkers, again, as specific or fishing expeditions. Now, the rationale of using combination therapy that as you can use the LVADs as a platform for drugs like evapridine um, or beta-2 agonist grimbuterol or gene therapy like I was telling you, and then can induce hypertrophy. But what is next? How can we decipher what is going on? I think you can do that by looking at complex networks, because that's a branch of science whereby you can determine controllability by looking at network topology and look for what is called decision versus um, other nodes, like um, nodes which are hub nodes, but not decision nodes. It's very important when you are faced with a swarm of millions of insects, for example, not to attack them with a broomstick, but actually think about it more rationally, decide where are the important um, nodes for decision and for myocardial reversibility. And this is an ongoing work which could be uh, greatly exciting. I hope I have convinced you that Bridge to Recovery offers unprecedented opportunities, both for the patients who benefit from it by combination therapy, but for deciphering the secrets of heart failure with the promise of discovering new therapeutic targets and specific therapies. Obviously, it's not easy and we are battling, like you saw, with the boy uh, being faced with a swarm of insects. Thank you very much.